You're listening to the Silicon Valley Podcast. All right, everyone. I'm here today with George Paris. Now, I'm very excited for today's episode. I've known George for years. Roger King, who is a past guest of the show, go back to our archives and check that out. He introduced me to George maybe seven, eight years ago. And well, George has been this confidant ever since, giving me wisdom advice. Now, George, I, I got to ask you, you're currently the deal, scr deal screening committee head at one of the oldest angel groups in Silicon Valley. So how did you get involved with pitch events, screening companies? What's the origin story? Okay, the origin story. Um, it's a little different, a little roundabout way of coming to the startup scene and uh, working with startups and going to pitch events. Um, this happened about 17, 18 years ago. My wife and I are in San Francisco on a Friday night. And the reason we were in San Francisco really uh, was because a friend of ours was having a photography exhibit out at Fort Mason. Now, because we live out in the Central Valley, the only way we can actually get to San Francisco on a Friday night is to leave almost in the middle of the afternoon to make sure we can get across the bridge traffic to get into San Francisco. Otherwise, it becomes a three and a half hour slog through bumper to bumper traffic and people trying to get to the theater or, or dinner or what have you. So uh, we're, we're literally uh, having a drink at a bar. And I knew a friend of mine had a networking event right next door. So I asked my wife, I said, would you be um, upset with me if I just ducked my head in there for about 20 minutes just to make an appearance and I'll come right back? And she said, sure, sure, go ahead, go ahead. So I duck out, I walk into this uh, building that probably could put 200 people in it, you know, comfortably. And there must have been about 325 people in there. And they're all screaming at the top of their lungs. And my friend that was having the event ran up to me and he said, I need you to be a judge of my pitch event tonight. And I looked at him and I said, well, I, I'd, I'd love to be able to, but I, I can't. I said, uh, we have a previous commitment. I, I said, how often do you do these things? And he goes, every month. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll come back next month and I'll be one of your judges and everything. So I go back, we go to the, you know, my wife and I go to the photography exhibit and everything. We go home, everything's fine. I get home and I think to myself, what the heck is a pitch event? So um, I start watching Shark Tank. I start picking, seeing what these people are doing and those things. So at least when I got in there three weeks later, maybe I had about a half a dozen questions I can ask a startup and everything and not embarrass myself in the process. So I show up, they introduce me as one of the judges. Um, it was so loud that the people that were pitching had to stand on a table to be seen over the 325 people that were in there getting drunk. Um, trying to pick up other people and all every other thing that you usually don't see at a pitch event. So this is my first pitch event. Um, we 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 picked a winner, and then after the event, um, we got together with the rest of the judges, and it was my first time to ask people about, uh, oh, you do this often and everything, and uh, how often do you do it? And I and I started buying everybody a round of drinks. And uh, about the second round of drinks that I bought, one of the judges looked at me and he says, you know, I got my own pitch event. He says, how'd you like to come and be a judge at one of my events? And that's how it starts. And eventually, as, as I built up this, this little network of getting to know people, I was literally going to four events a week and uh, sometimes five. And I did that for about a year until my wife told me, she says, that's enough of this. I never see you again. If you want to stay married to me, you got to cut back on the on this stuff that you're going to every night. And I said, OK, honey. All right. So uh, eventually I knocked it back to like two a week and the rest is history. But um, that's how I got started. That's how I got started in, in the pitch event world in dealing with startups that were really kind of putting it all out on the line. That was my first experience with that. Um, a lot. I was really amazed at the live event process that I had experienced as a kid because I had a fake ID and I was able to get into the Fillmore West and Winterland and everything and see all the great musicians and musical groups of the day, uh, whether it was Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin or Blood, Sweat and Tears or Chicago or 
Janis Joplin, Big Brother and the Holding Company. And, and there was something to see, a, a live event that I got plugged into right away. So th this whole thing about how a pitch deck is constructed and seeing it in its very early stages so that you, you see it and then you hear it and then you experience. I'd already kind of gone through that as a kid watching these great, great, great musicians play when I was 18, 19 years old. So seeing something, hearing something, and then experience something really has a deep resonance to me that takes me back to the times when I was a kid. So, um, you know, the whole idea of going to a live event that's a pitch event kind of takes me back to those days. That's actually the real, real genesis of how I got started with this kind of stuff because it prepared me for seeing something live, instantaneous, and in the moment. And as much as entrepreneurs try to practice these things, it's always amazed me when it comes time to do it live, how different it could be from one pitch to the next. Just, just different, just different. Always exciting to me. Um, I still have the hope that I want everybody who's pitching at an event that I'm going to, to knock it out of the park. I really, really do. I'm not there to see somebody fall on their face. I, I, I actually, the, the most interesting pitch I think I ever saw at a Bay Angels event, it was an engineering-driven startup, and the founder was so nervous, so nervous, he could barely talk. And Roger did something that was really interesting. He said, let's just take a little, a little break, just for a second and everything. He walked over to the guy, he put his arm around him, and I could kind of hear him. Soto voce, you know, in the in the air in the row that I was sitting in, and he says, "Look, don't worry about it." He says, "If you got to read the pitch, read the pitch." And actually, it was one of the best pitches of the night when the guy, his hands were literally shaking as he went through this thing. But that was really one extreme, you know, one very very. I mean, I, 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 my heart went out to the guy because. Uh, I had a pretty good feeling of what he was going through, getting up in front of a group of strangers and 125 high-powered investors in a room. And this was his dream. And this is what he'd been working on for the last three years of his life. And he just couldn't get the words out. So um, I think there were a couple of investors that did get in touch with him that wanted to you know, give him a cup of coffee and bring him into the office and See, so, you know, where he's going with this thing. But I'll never forget that pitch as long as I live. That must have been nine years ago, nine years ago when that happened, at least. So, um, yeah, I've seen just about everything, uh, including uh, judges bringing entrepreneurs to tears, which I hate. But um, uh, as head of the deal flow uh, that comes into Bay Angels, one of the things I'm always hoping for is, is man, Come on, man, show me what you got. I'm really excited to see what it is that you have here. And I want to be able to take the, the, um, the, the rubric that we use in Bay Angels, apply it to their pitch deck, and see, you know, is it working for a Bay Angels pitch event? And that, and that rubric is really, really, really important because we all, as, as members who go to these things, have our favorites. We all have things that we're always, always, always interested in. But what the rubric does is it kind of takes the emotion out of it. And you have 10 items that you're judging every deck by, and every item is, sc is scored 1 to 10. And you just add up the numbers at the end, uh, at the, end of the deck and see how it plays. Now, if those numbers come in at around 70 or above, there's a good chance that they'll make the first cut. You and I both know what happens after that, what, what takes to play. We got to go from maybe 200 down to 20, from 20 to 8, 8 to 6. And that's how that's basically how we do it there at Bay Angels. George, there was a lot there. Now let's just yeah. go back to kind of that origin story. Yeah. So you got thrown in the fire on that first pitch event as a judge. How nervous are judges at some of these events? And how did you go about getting those questions to even ask? Because, I mean, you're probably sitting next to some experienced venture capitalists, sure. some experienced judges. And yet, you know, at the end there, you've mentioned someone inviting you to be a judge at their future events. So obviously they thought you were you were in the group. They, they couldn't tell the difference. Yeah, I, I think 
from the very, very beginning, and especially after I was watching those TV shows, I started noticing a pattern that was starting to occur with all the judges. You know, there was a problem that every startup was trying to solve, and the solution, which really was the meat of the problem, which was the meat of why that entrepreneur was on that program, followed immediately. And the faster they got to the problem and the faster they got to the solution, the more engaged it seemed like the judges were. And so it kind of stuck with me a little bit. Okay, all right, maybe that's one of the keys. You know, don't take so long to talk about the problem that you're trying to solve, get to the meat of it, and then let's see what you got. You know, because seeing what you got entails a lot. I mean, it entails, I mean, it involves your team. It involves your revenue streams. It, it involves how long you've been in business, the projections of revenues over the next three to five years, you know, whether those projections factor in by a, a factor of 3x or 5x in terms of growth in revenue. Uh, it has a lot to do with how long you've been doing this. Um, what, what are the team's background? Has anybody been in the startup world before? Are you guys all newbies? What's your advisory panel look like? I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And we take all of these things into consideration. But that very first thing was, I, I it drove me crazy when people took a five-minute pitch and wasted two minutes of their pitch talking about the problem that they're trying to solve. And then they have to boat race through the rest of the pitch to talk about the solution, the team slide, the revenue slide, and everything else that needed to be done. I said, you know, we want them to succeed, but assuming that the judge doesn't know about the problem that you're trying to solve is, is a real waste of time, real waste of time. And, and it drove other investors that I talked to felt the same way about that. So maybe that was one of the things that kicked off that first guy that said, hey, I got my own pitch event. How'd you like to join the party? Now, everything else that I heard, because every business has acronyms that you have to learn, I just ask somebody and say, what, the, what are they talking about? You know, I, I mean, what's that mean? Or I'd write it down and I'd go home and I'd Google it and I'd figure it out sooner or later. So then it would make sense. And even finding out these things, you had to be really careful about how I introduced them into my, my, my questions, because um, it's kind of one of those things a, a lawyer never asks um, Somebody in a court of law question unless he knows the answer. And same thing applies at a pitch event. You better know what the heck you're talking about or you'll get found out really, really fast. From your experience, how realistic for our audience that have never been to a pitch event, huh? how realistic is you know the TV show Shark Tank versus one of these in-person pitch events for one for a seed or a round company? Well, I think. Well, you know, if I'm not mistaken, you had um, a company that you went down to put on that show, right? And you saw how long it took. And I mean, the whole day, it was a whole day thing. What goes on air is probably what, three minutes, two minutes or something like that. They have the, um, the, the absolute luxury of being able to edit everything that comes out of everybody's mouth so that everybody seems pretty, pretty intelligent, you know, and there's a flow to everything that they do. Uh, live events, you got no shot at that. And uh, it's always interesting to me um, how some entrepreneurs can stay on point and other entrepreneurs, I mean, I, I, you wonder if they dropped acid before they gave their pitch sometimes. I mean, it goes off into the stratosphere and it, they're like a great Jesuit priest at Sunday Mass. I mean, they start up something, they go off into the atmosphere, and they never come back to that that initial phrase of what it is they were trying to talk about. Same thing with uh, some of the entrepreneurs I've seen. You know, when you yell time, and, <laughs> and they're barely through the solution part of their pitch, that's not a good sign. That's not a good sign at all. <laughs> well, you kind of mentioned some of the problems that startups have with their, their presentation, but I mean, what are some of the biggest challenges? And, and actually, I'm wondering, you said about 18 years ago. So this was two, three years after the dot-com crash, yeah. correct? Yeah. How have you seen kind of these events evolve over, 
you know, post.com crash to the Great Recession to, you know, pre-pandemic to now, how have they evolved over that that span of time? Well, um, you know, we always see the great movements that come and go in tech. You know, we, we see the, um, let's go back to the 90s and the AS400 that was going to replace the mainframe, right, on the hardware side of things. And, um, you know, there will be no more data centers because everything will be distributed. And, you know, now now we're looking at SaaS, and that's a whole other different movement towards how data is being stored. Uh, we're, we're looking at, at these, these kind of hot topics that kind of come and go. Uh, and, and but they, you know, they they the ones that stay, they stay there for a reason. Um, I, I vividly remember this thing called fintech that was first introduced, and you know, it just took off like a house of fire. You know, followed by AI, and every pitch you saw was, you know, we are an AI back based, you know, app that's coming to market and everything, and uh, then blockchain and blockchain this and blockchain that, and I mean. Uh, well, these things are there for a reason. Uh, most of the time they're there because they work, which is important. But it, it's kind of, you know, it, it's really hard to find those disruptive moments that kind of are thrown our way in, in, the, uh, in the startup world. Because you get a lot, of, a lot of startups that are no more than just feature functionality. I call them feature functionality startups. And those startups, you know, well, we're going to take this technology that's working, but it doesn't do this. Now, if we, if we, if our startup takes that functionality and adds it to the big players, you know, offering, we're going to be able to overtake them. Well, yeah, maybe, but more often than not, that big player is just going to swap your technology and roll it into his own offering acquire you and then you'll nobody will ever see or hear from you again make a lot of money sometimes but in, but other times they just um, they just take it they just take it and then litigation follows as to you know who took whom who, who started this and all that kind of garbage that goes on it, it's it's always fascinated me how how um the due diligence of the startup scene was vastly different than the dot-com era because I knew a ton of guys that got dot-com money and they were all silver-tongued devils, every single one of them, right? And it was almost like the investors didn't do oh, their due George, diligence. Some of, us, some of us aren't familiar with all this lingo here. Silver-tongued devil, could you, uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, sure, sure. Um, there was... Um, there was a guy that put out an app, right? And the only thing the app did was, you know, play it on your phone. And when your phone rang, it went, yo, yo. The guy got a check for $550,000. You know, and, and he had him, and it was just him and a buddy and everything. And, the long, you know, they, they did terrible things with the money. I mean, they did terrible things. Um, to say that they reinvested in the economy of San Francisco was was fine if you consider the economy in San Francisco to be along Broadway, you know, and and all the denizens of, of vice that were located along Broadway in San Francisco because all their money was spent there. And, and within a short period of time, they were broke and nobody would give them any more money. That's just one example of the kinds of things that went on. I saw um, other startups uh, get around to funding. On, on a Friday and on Monday, a uh, hundred programmers would show up at their warehouse space. The cubes were built. They started banging code. I would go to a lot of these companies and I would ask them, I'd say, what are you building? I don't know. I'm just, you know, they tell me to build this. I build it. Okay. All right. Um, but every single one of those places had the indoor basketball courts, you know, the, the, the industrial refrigerators full of, you know, Snapple and wine and beer. Um, you know, it was it was you know copy repeat, copy paste, copy repeat all the time. So I think the due diligence that's done on 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 the part of investors today is much better than it was in the dot com era. I'll give you another example. I uh, 
I was selling phone switches during that time of the dot-com era. So, of course, startups needed data and voice on one line going into a bill. All right. Um, I had a wonderful, wonderful woman that ran a small business in, in the hometown where I live. And I went in to see her one day after I was off work and got off the freeway and I ran in there and she says, oh, George, she said, um, you're you're in that tech thing in in San Francisco in the Silicon Valley, right? I said, yeah. She says, well, my broker just told me to, you know, buy a thousand shares of this company. And I'm just going to put this fictional name for this company and, and call it two Z's, two Y's, two X, Zizix or something like that, right? She says, he wants me to buy a thousand shares of Zizix. Well, it just so happened that that day I had been in Zizix headquarters and their building where all of their employees were located. And I said, please don't buy Zizix stock. Please just don't do it. Well, she says, my broker strongly suggests that I do. I says, your broker doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. It's as simple as that, all right? I said, you know, at the time, I kind of knew Yahoo was under was undervalued. And I said, take your thousand shares and go buy Yahoo stock. It's going to probably double in the next six months. And it did. And after that, I started getting calls from all kinds of old ladies in Stockton. And but that's that's another story. All right. They all wanted their, you know, my take on the tech scene in, in Silicon Valley at that point. But, you know, and, and every all our listeners, no financial advice here. This is nope, a story from absolutely. way in the past, 20 years ago. So uh, <laughs> and and I didn't benefit from any of it either. That's the other part of it, too. I still had to pay full boat on the at you know, for full retail on where all these businesses. So. But, you know, those that kind of stuff was going on all the time. I mean, these companies that had no foundation, they had nothing to build on and everything. And they were just really a, a they were an idea that had been financed and a little more than that. And I think that's the reason why when the dot com boom hit the bust period, it was a real wake-up call for everybody involved. It was a wake-up call for the entrepreneurs. It was a wake-up call for the investors. I mean, you know, everybody was pr- walking on eggs there for a while, and then you started hearing about this stuff called the startups that are coming in. But everybody was a little more patient. Nobody got a check written to them overnight. It took at least you know ninety to one hundred and twenty to one hundred and eighty days for anybody to get funded, and the investors weren't stupid. You know, they'd say, well, we're going to write you a check for a million bucks, but we're only going to give you 250 now. You have to hit all of these bullet points in terms of your progression along the way. When you hit that first set of bullet points, you get another 250K, right? And uh, most of the entrepreneurs thought that, you know, because somebody said they were going to underwrite their action for a million bucks, they were, okay, they're in the promised land. Well, no, no, they they had to do the things that the investor knew had to be done in order for his investment to at least stay alive, you know, which was really important at the time. So you see this in various forms all over. And, and it's always uh, amazed me that through all of these changes that you see, when you see these, these big waves of, um, uh, well, you know, uh, electric cars, electric scooters, electric skateboards, fintech, um, you know, what what, what did I, you know, these things that just have kind of come, some have come and gone, and some are still with us. But the thing that I've always been amazed through the years is how much, how much smarter the investor has gotten and how, how they've been able to adapt to some of these changes that are being thrown at them and everything where people are coming and saying, hey, look, I think I got something here. You know, let's sit down and uh, let me tell you a little bit about what it is that I'm doing and everything. I think that those instances where, you know, you get the fit between the investor and the entrepreneur, it's it's as great as anything I saw at Winterland, anything I saw at the Fillmore West when I was a kid. It's exciting. It's exciting because it's the birth and we, it's it's the birth of something that could be disruptive and a game changer within a whole business vertical, which is something that really scares the big boys. And uh, hopefully we'll always keep scaring them, keeps them on their toes. You said something there that was really interesting, the match between the right investor and the the right startup. 
Mm -hmm. Can you go deeper into that? Sure, sure. Based on my experience and how long I've been doing this, it, it, it's, a, it's imperative that the entrepreneur does his homework with the investors that he meets or she meets at the pitch events that they're pitching at. Because not every investor invests across the board, across different business verticals at, at all, in any way, shape, or form. You have some that are only going to invest in healthcare. There are some that are only going to invest in AI-backed startups. There are some that will only invest in an AI blockchain startup. And there are some that will only, you know, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. I mean, so, you know, investors know their niche better than anybody in the world. I mean, they really do, because in the case of angel investors, they're investing in their own money. But also in the case of funds, you know, that's equally important to the VCs that are controlling those funds. So everybody's got their action kind of segmented out. Every investor out there is really good about really knowing one thing. And within that one thing, they know they know it worldwide. So, you know, and, and if the entrepreneur doesn't even take the time to get onto Crunchbase, TechCrunch, Angel.co to try to find out, okay, when's the last time this investor invested? What was the company that he invested in or she invested in? You know, what's the business vertical that they invested in? That's just minimal homework that the, that the entrepreneur has to do, you know? And sometimes they don't. And sometimes they're really disappointed. Well, okay, go do your homework. Simple as that. Now, going back to the, the pitches, yeah. Have you seen those change over time from what either maybe the investors are asking for or the startups are focusing on or have they evolved at all? Or has it always been kind of that 10 slide pitch deck with problem solution and some other things? It, it depends on the event and it depends on who's putting on the event. It, it really does. I would say by and large. 75% of the pitch events that I've gone to or have been going to, it's the 10 slide deck. You know, um, somebody always tries to put video in their deck. It never works. It submarines the pitch. Never, never, never put video in your pitch deck. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. However, uh, there are other, there have been some other types of events where it has gotten more creative where they spend more time on the solution and then they jump right to, I mean, really get into the numbers fast because they understand that the investor is driven by numbers, numbers, numbers. So they've hit the two major focuses of how they see their pitch and how they want to be seen and remembered. They want to be remembered as the solution that they presented and the numbers that they've given the investors. The last, you know, the last two slides, you know, team slide and the exit slide are like boom, boom, like that, usually at those kinds of events. Some places, more often than not, uh, it just depends on who's, like I said, if you go and look at who's putting on the event, you got a pretty good idea of what kind of pitches you're going to be seeing. It's as simple as that. I think um, it, it's always interested me about Bay Angels because, you know, I probably went to, Bay Angels events for as long as I've known you for the eight or nine years. And I've always, I've always been fascinated by how the event is presented. And there was some consistency there that worked, you know, over a period of time. But one of the things that I always thought was something that was interesting that Bay Angels did that some, I didn't see at a lot of other events. The entrepreneur was always number one at their events. You always got the feeling that the entrepreneur was, was there and he was kind of put on a pedestal and everybody that worked at Bay Angels understood this maxim. If you don't have any pitches, if you don't have any entrepreneurs, you don't have a pitch event. So you better value them, whether their pitch is a rock 'em sock 'em, knock it out of the park pitch or whether the pitch kind of lies there and doesn't go anywhere. And that was after working with those individuals because every Bay Angel that, uh, event that uh, had startups that pitched went through a process where they had to come into the Bay Angel's office. They had to 
break down their pitch decks. They had to build up their pitch decks again. And then the night of the pitch, sometimes they just laid flat. And it wasn't, it really wasn't the fault, I think, of Bay Angels at that point. Sometimes people just really never grasped how important that that the whole idea of pitching their idea really was. You know, you sometimes you got the feeling that um, if I build it, they will come. Mm. You know, they never come. They never come. I mean, that's crazy stuff. I mean. If you build it, you still got to market it. You still have to sell it. You have to do all the things that you need to do in order to get that company up and running. Not only up and running, but being able to scale to the next level, wherever that may be. So, you know, I've always been fascinated by pitch event producers that put the entrepreneur first. And if they're not, I think their events always suffer. And you and I both know who those people are. <laughs> That's the one thing I think I've always been kind of amazed at how the startups, the audience, everyone at a lot of locations put the judges and the investors on this pedestal. When in reality, if the entrepreneurs weren't there, none of the investors would have jobs. I mean, the VCs and that, that raise capital to deploy in these startups, if the startups weren't there, they wouldn't be able to go out and raise money on on the behalf of the idea that we're going to invest it. So it's always kind of been a mystery to me why even startups are so nervous to talk to investors. It's almost like, hey, we're we're the ones helping you guys do your jobs. But yeah. Yeah. but George, you have a background in sales, right? Right. A lot of startups, one of the first things they struggle with is sales, getting mm-hmm. those first clients, marketing, getting getting those. Sure. Pilots and that from your experience in sales, what advice and wisdom can you pass down to to startups to help build those sales channels, get those first clients? Uh, One of the things that you asked me about is how things changed. I, I think investors are looking at revenue now as being early revenue being a critical part of every startup. And if those numbers are really not there, based on the fact that they've only been in business for three to six years, three to six months, it, it makes the investor a little wary. No, not I mean, because of, you know, they think to themselves, they don't know how to, they, they really don't know how to sell their idea. They, they really don't. I mean, it, it's kind of one of those things, well, we're going to build an app and this is going to be the greatest app in the world. And well, who's your competition? Um, we don't have any competition. And you Google the name of the company and you find out they got 5,000 competitors already in the field. And you look at the size of the Google store and the Apple store. Well, there's probably a pretty good chance that there's, you know, a hundred different apps that kind of do the thing that these guys want to do or these gals want to do. So. Um, not being able to sell it to somebody is a critical mistake that I think a lot of early stage startups do. Uh, revenue producers, and I got my own feelings about sales and, and what they do. Revenue producers should be treated like you know really important people in the early stage startup scene, and I wonder if they are right now, because um, if they're not going, if they're not able to go out and sell the idea, the business idea. Who is doing it for this company? It's not the marketing people. It's usually not the tech guys. And it's certainly not the founder if the founder's got a background in engineering. You know, let's just put it that way. All right. More often than not, um, you got to go out and find yourself a couple of silver tongue devils to be able to do the deed for your company in order to be able to get those numbers that investors want to see now. And I think um, not having them or having inconsistent sales is is uh it's it's a big red flag for investors a real big red flag for them uh how do you find how do you find good salespeople? well you can always kind of come and talk to me i'm happy to do that that's a long conversation that's not going to take place here but i'll tell you a real good quick story about a, a startup all right they call me up they find me on linkedin they said we would like you to come to our offices and take a look at our compensation plan I said, well, how many employees do you have? They said, we have 12 employees. And I said, how many salespeople do you have? They go, two. And I said, you guys want me to look at your comp plan? And they go, yeah. 
And I said, all right, I got some time tomorrow to uh, segment a half hour out for me. I don't think I'll need more than a half hour to figure this out for you guys. All right. So I get in my car in Stockton at noon. I get to the office at about five minutes to two. I walk in and I said, all right, let's get going. And they hand me this, this document that's 12 pages long, single space and double sided. And I look at this thing and I start reading it and I said, all right, which one of you guys worked at Google? <laughs> and they all start looking at their shoelaces, you know, they really started hemming and hawing. And I said, look, 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 this is for a Fortune 500 company. This is for a multinational. This is overkill for what you guys need and everything. And, and they said, well, what should we do? And I say, pay your two salespeople a flat 10% of whatever in the heck they bring through the door. They go, 10%? That's a lot of money. And I said, at your stage right now, if you can't live on 90 cents out of every dollar that they're bringing through the door, there's nothing that's going to save you right now, okay? And they go, well, what, what about the other employees and everything when these two guys are making more money than us and everything? And I said, give them the same deal. If they want to become salespeople, you give them a million dollar quota. They don't make it at the end of the year. They're gone. They're fired. How's that? That usually shuts people up because that's what these guys are running around and carrying on their. That's the monkey that they carry on their back every day as salespeople. All right. So um, they looked at me and they said, well, um, yeah, you want to check or something like that? And I said, no, no, I don't want to check. And, you know, I looked at my watch. It was 2.15 for a two o'clock meeting, right? I said, um, go down to the, here, I said, here's my address. Here's my home address and zip code, you know, right? Don't lose this. Go down to the house of Prime Rib and get me a gift certificate for 250 bucks, and we'll call it square. And they go, that's all you want? And I said, well, the next time my wife and I come to San Francisco, we'll go out and have a nice dinner. How's that sound? I, I mean, we'd like that. If that's good enough for you guys, that's fine with us. By the way, if you need help down the line and everything, you could still call me back at any time. That was kind of the way it worked so that I, I went in and I worked with those people at least a half dozen more times and everything throughout the years. So uh, th there are ways of helping people that don't cost an arm and a leg, the people that have real world experience to be able to help them to get over the hump. That's just one example of how I helped that one startup. Do you think that startups under underestimate the value of salespeople? Do you think that investors yeah. Maybe under, underestimate the value. I, where do you think? Because I always hear engineers, 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 oh. aqua hires. Let's get these engineers in here. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't hear much about the salespeople. Why? Well, because an engineering driven company with engineering founders don't know how to sell their, don't know how to sell. They don't know how to walk up to somebody, a complete total stranger and find a way of getting that complete total stranger to give them money for this business idea. They don't have a clue how to do that. And they almost think it's kind of beneath them. I think maybe, who knows? I, I, you know, I don't want to speak for all engineers like that, but in a lot of cases, um, there's, there's talent on one end and there's talent on the other end but you need all of those talented people to be working together in order for a company to be successful. And that's why I think that um, unsuccessful startups or startups that kind of uh, get off to a real fast start and then peak and they can't get beyond where they're at. I think that if you look back and see those things, there's always a weakness somewhere in that team. Always, always, always. Just depends on how that team has been founded, the business idea behind it, who's driving it. And if, uh, look, um, if engineering doesn't uh, understand that marketing and sales are critical components to the success of their company, just as sales and marketing people don't think, you know, engineering people, well, yeah, we need one or two. Well, no, you need, you need, you need forceful representation of all these business practices that are going to make your company successful. And if you don't have an understanding of that, your, your company's probably going to flutter out and just wither and die. So I think um, not having, it's not only not having an appreciation, it's not understanding business as a whole where um, that's why 
salespeople might be giving the short shrift of, of you know the stick, as you put it, so to speak. George, question for you. You help companies from all over the world when they come to Silicon Valley on their visits. Mm-hmm. A lot of these universities, a lot of these MBA students, kind of what questions do they have for you? What kind of surprises do they have? What are, you know, what comes up in conversation? Okay. Um, there are actually two types of questions that I've been asked because there's pre-COVID questions and there's post-COVID questions. And the pre-COVID questions were always centered around the fact that, um, okay, you got two universities that are sending 25 to 35 MBA students. I'm teaching classes uh, you know, on the pitch deck, the elevator pitch, and how to network in this country. And a lot of the questions were centered around how come it moves so fast here? You know, what, why the pace? And I said, you know, a lot of that had to do with the, I said, just think about, okay, your own background. All right. You're growing up on, in, in either, and you're taking classes in Paris or Lyon or Bordeaux at the, at the campuses that your universities have. So your life has probably been, either centered around those cities that you grew up in, and now you're going to school in those areas, and you're coming over here and you're seeing a completely different way of life. And you're trying to figure out what is this thing about innovation in the Silicon Valley? Because people can be innovative anywhere in the world, but why this long, long history of innovation, going back to the birth of Hewlett Packard and, you know, with the two guys in the garage and everything through Apple and, and all these things. But currently, why does it move so fast? It moves so fast because think about what you just did. You got on a, you got on an airplane, you flew eight and a half to 10 hours to get here. And just think about every day, how many entrepreneurs are getting off planes, just like you got off the plane as a student, who are coming here to get their piece of the pie. Think about all those countries in Europe, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Turkey, Greece, whose whose economies are not really doing as well as they're do, that they would hope to be doing for the youth that are coming of that are the same age as you guys, and they're leaving their families and they're leaving their friends to come here because they have to come here, and they're hungry. And then you think about all the students that are here in this country who are graduating from universities every single year who come here also. So think about all of that traffic that's starting to generate in this one place and everybody trying to get their business ideas born. That's the reason why it has to be fast, because there's just not enough time to filter all of those ideas and all of those people into something that hopefully may or may not work one day. Now, the last two groups post-COVID that came both had this similar questions, but the one questions that, that they had, all of them, was where is everybody? Where is everybody in San Francisco? We thought this was a city that was busy and jumping and full of people. We're not seeing anybody. 5 p.m., it seems like it's a ghost town around here. So, you know, that was kind of an interesting take from pre-COVID to post-COVID in terms of what it is that these kids want. The other part of it is that from my perspective, after they've been jammed, jammed, jammed with information, 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 information for eight weeks, is I get up and I teach these kids, the very first thing that comes out of my mouth is, there is one thing I want you to learn over the time that you and I spend as instructor and student. I want you to only take one thing home with you, but I want you to be able to that one thing six months from now. And they all look at me and they go, what's that going to be? And one time I said, to know that in Silicon Valley, there is the Silicon Valley podcast hosted by my friend, Sean Flynn. (laughs) And they go, what's that? And I said, all right, here's your assignment for tomorrow. Okay, here's, here's the website. I want you to go to it. I want you to listen to an interview. All right. And look. I said, you're all going to go home. You're going to spend 10 hours on a plane. You can listen to three of them on the way home, all right? Be constructive with your time. Go learn something, all right? 
So um, that's that's what I that's what I've been teaching these kids and everything to know of your existence and this broadcast. Uh, how's that sound, huh? George, I'm not sure how we're going to edit this in, but it's it's. I'm not sure. Maybe this is the whole podcast itself. We just put that one segment on repeat, play it five times. That's an hour. But uh, George, thank you. <laughs> you know, all these students, you know, they're all going to learn how to how to construct a, a, a pitch deck. They're all going to know how to do an elevator pitch. They're all going to learn how to network in this country. But the long and short of it is I want them to take home just one thing and try to remember it six months from now. And whatever that one thing is, I want it to stay with them because you and I both know, and especially if you've taken any, and in my case, I don't know how many times I've been in sales training, different sales gurus teaching you how to sell and all. We forget 99% of what it is that they've taught us during those week-long training sessions, literally within two weeks after we've gone through those, those things. So, you know, my hope and my dream is that they look at what it is that I'm doing to help them in those three areas, pitch deck, elevator pitch, and networking, and be able to remember one thing from six months later in their lives and their existence so that they go, oh, yeah, I, I kind of remember that. I do kind of remember that. Best example, back in, it wasn't six months ago, but in July, I met a group of entrepreneurs from Germany. And um, I actually heard six pitches that day. We talked a little bit about the pitch decks that they were putting together. And on Friday, I got a pitch deck from one of them uh, that said, uh, we're trying to send this pitch deck to investors. And I looked at it and I said, okay, all right. Um, I said, you, we need to talk. Let's jump on a Zoom call. Yesterday, we got on that call. And I said, look, you guys, if you want to send a deck to investors, it better be an investor deck because they're usually numbers heavy. I said, have any of you put together an investor deck? And they went, no. And I said, well, you don't want to send a pitch deck to investors. You just don't want to do that. Send an investor deck. Here's how we put together an investor deck. And we went through the whole thing. And they came out of it, uh, their pitch deck looks better now, their investor deck looks serviceable. And I, I'm hoping that in that case of meeting them back in July, and now they remembered at least, hey, I said, look, before you send your deck out to the big boys, run it by me. It doesn't cost you anything. And if you make mistakes, we'll catch them early before you send it out and not hear from anybody. Worst thing in the world that could happen is that they call you in for a cup of coffee and then they read you the riot act about your pitch deck once you get inside their, their offices. So you don't want to do that either. And everything. Here, you, you just want to avoid wasting the investor's time as well as wasting your own time. All right. I've seen enough of these things. I know what needs to go into them in order for it to be a productive experience. And that's part of the thing that you also want to do as an entrepreneur, you know? Don't waste the investor's time. Don't do it. That's not, that's very interesting. I mean, definitely don't waste the investor's time because that's actually wasting your time as well. With so many investors will take meetings just because a friend made an introduction or that. When in reality, there's no way they're going to write a check for what you're doing. It's not in their investment thesis. But mm -hmm. one thing you had mentioned that I, I don't think we've really covered on this show in all you know 150 episodes or so is that there are different pitch decks. There's the pitch deck when you're there presenting. There's that pitch deck when you're sending to get the, the meeting. There's all types of pitch decks, whether it's a seven minute, five minute, three minute, 10 minute, whatever it is, that it's not just one that's a fit all scenario. It's really customized to the situation, who's it presented to, the, and it's always evolving. And that's something that you just brought up that I, I mean, we might have to do a, a whole episode just on that, on the different types of pitch decks, on the marketing materials to send out to investors. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's something most people don't realize, I think. Yeah. You know, there's also another thing, you know, if you get a call from, from an investor group and everything. The first thing you should do after that phone call has been completed 
is to jump on Crunchbase or TechCrunch to find out where have these people invested in the past? Who have they invested with? And then go to those companies and say, hey, was there anything in your deck that was something that you know these guys really liked? And make sure it's in alignment with what it is that you're doing. You know, you can avoid a lot of heartache by just doing a little bit of due diligence that way, just a little bit. You know, and instead of uh, instead of you, you always want the meeting to become a working meeting as an entrepreneur. You know, you say, ah, you know, take out your laptop. This is going to be a working session here and everything. We're going to write you a check. Let's get going and everything. You've had, those are the words every invest every entrepreneur wants to hear from an investor. But until you do the due diligence to put you in the driver's seat of being able to rehear that, hear those magic words, the likelihood of that happening is pretty slim, pretty slim. That also reminded me of a past interview we did with Nathan Beckham, the founder of Founder Suite. Right. He uh, is creating a repository of questions that the companies on their platform were asked by different VCs so that future startups that go to those meetings with the VCs will know if, hey, this one seemed to ask a lot about you know, what metrics were hidden. This one seemed to ask a lot about our traction. This one seemed to ask so that you can customize, prepare going to those meetings. And, and that is huge because you're yeah. customizing your, your talking points to the person across the table from you. So you're really going to resonate your message with them in a language that they're able to understand. So, so George, that's, you know, you've seen it and I've seen it too. You know, the entrepreneur with the tunnel vision, like the train coming for the, for the tunnel and they can't see anything out here. And and it's the same thing when, you know, you get into conversations with people, you, they need to be able to go this way as well as go this way and everything. They they just have to gotta be nimble enough as they say. All right, George, now pivot in. Yeah. You're currently living in Stockton, California, and most people don't think of Stockton as a tech center. We think the Diaz brothers, MMA fighting, we think of TV shows that paint it as this you know, difficult to live area. Yeah. What is the st- startup ecosystem actually like there? What are you doing and working with the city on right now? Hey, um, we, have, um, we have an interesting culture in, in Stockton. Um, we have uh, there's no, no it, it's a tough town. Um, you, you can't be soft and be able to survive out here and by any stretch of the imagination. But what's changing is because of the housing situation in the Silicon Valley and San Francisco and the East Bay, a lot of people are leaving to come out here and buy a brand new home and get a 4,000, 5,000 square foot home for, you know, what a down payment might get you in, in San Francisco or say Santa Clara. Um, and that's a brand new home. That's a home you don't have to worry about the foundation or the roof going in the next 20 years. Uh, that's probably got solar, you know, on the roof so that your PG and E bills can withstand the heat and, and the winters that you have to go through out here. A lot of the a lot of the infrastructure that we take for granted when you're living in the Bay Area, things like BART, things being able to get from point A to point B in a relatively short period of time, uh, you got to. It's kind of uh, you got to live in your car a little bit out here. You know, you got to your four wheels become your lifeline to be able to get from point A to point B. When you're trying to build a company to do that and get out and talk to prospects whom you hopefully will become customers of your startup and everything, a lot of that has to take place because people don't spend every waking day in the digital world every day. They got companies, they're running their companies, they're taking care of their employees. Um, You know, a lot of them are not driven by technology. And uh, one of the things that I have found is that um, there's a big, big, and always has been a big emphasis on getting people jobs. Really important out here. The entrepreneur was kind of pushed off to the side, but with this huge influx of people from the Bay Area, guess what's changing? They come out here and they see the pace of life and they see the infrastructure and they don't like it, all right? So one of the startups that went through my company now has four co-working spaces in the city of Tracy, California, so that people might be able to not have to get on the road 
every day of the week to get to their job in Sunnyvale or San Jose or Palo Alto or Oakland or San Francisco. They run it through the co-working space, and that didn't exist. Didn't exist five years ago. It, it, it exists now. Uh, there's homes being built everywhere. I mean, everywhere. So soon we'll have you know that awful gridlock that the San Fernando Valley and Los Angeles has. Um, but until that happens, and it's not that far off in the future, um, when people kind of come from the areas that support technology and support the infrastructure of startups and and that mindset kind of come out here, it's a double-edged sword because the politicians who are local and probably growing up here and never left town are afraid a little bit, just a little bit. And so uh, because we want things done now, we want things done fast, and we don't want to hear a story about, well, we have to have 18 committees, 18 committee members get together and talk about this business problem. We see the business problem. We understand the business problem. What's your solution? So that mindset is kind of where I act as a bridge between local politicians and people who are trying to get things moving in the startup world and then provide them a platform to, and I want to say this really, really clear, in a non-denominational way that doesn't uh, adhere to any current or former political party, when they go through the programs that I put together, if I find that somebody's out on social media getting involved on the left or the right, they're asked to leave the program. The reason they do that is because I tell them really quickly from day one, I said, look, as, as, a, as a startup, as somebody who's in a startup position out here, you can't afford to make enemies. You need 100% of the available market to sell your products or services to. All right. So as soon as you take a stand on one of these things, one way or another, you lose half your available market. It just goes whoosh, out the door. So avoid that at all costs. Don't get involved with people, you know, and talking about religions and all that other stuff. Just avoid it. Avoid it. Avoid it. So that all set aside and everything. How how this uh, how how are the startups out here? Um, they are not driven by. A lot of places where they say, um, I want my kid to go to Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, Cal. They're, I mean, they're just, they're not, okay? And, uh, but one of the things I've noticed about the economic background that the entrepreneurs out here come from, they're tough. They're tough kids uh, on both sides of the fence. Tough women, tough men. There's no quit in them, none. And um, I noticed that when um, when when the pandemic hit, uh, a lot of them were scared because they had just starting to get a little traction. And they came to me and they said, what do we do? And I, said, I told every one of them, none of you quit. Just I'm going to show you how to get through this. And step by step, I'll make sure that you get through this thing and you'll come out stronger on the other side. And out of the... 14 companies that I helped through that pandemic, only one didn't make it. And uh, so that's a pretty good track record. Now, are these people scaling to the point where investors might be interested in them? No, not yet. Not yet. It's going to take them a little longer time to be able to do it. And it's just tougher to get paying customers out here. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We're finding interesting ways to help get these to, to build the bridges that need to take place for generations to follow. I mean, it's always hard to be the first first kids on the block to be able to, you know, go out and build this thing called a new business. And um, but there, I got a lot of faith in the in the people that I'm involved with out here doing this. It always helps to have some people involved on the in the public sector who are looking for these kinds of advancements out here. And so far, I've been really, really lucky. So city government, uh, state government, federal representatives in, in Congress have all been very, very, very supportive. So I can't ask for anything more than that. All right, George. And with that, we are coming up on time for this week's episode of the Silicon Valley podcast. If anyone wants to find out more information about you, what you're working on, what's the best way to contact you, and if you have any any information you want to bestow upon the audience as we sign off, 
you know, this is your time to do so. Oh, uh, how do you get a hold of me? Uh, the easiest way, just get on LinkedIn. Let's go to George Parrish. I mean, I got to be one of the only people on the on all of LinkedIn that when you click on contact info on LinkedIn, you'll actually see my phone number and email address there. So if you can't find me then, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I got, I'm on Facebook and, uh, you know, I got a, I got a Gmail account. So, you know, there's absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm here to help anybody that needs help. It's as simple as that. I've always taken the tack that when I first started out in teaching, when I, when I graduated from graduate school, I always put the student number one, always, always, it wasn't about me in any way, shape or form working with startups for the last 18 years and everything. I've managed to put the entrepreneur number one. Everything I do is to help support them and to help make them successful. And it's not about me. It's never about me. All right, George, with that, I want to thank you for your time this week on the Silicon Valley podcast. I look forward to, well, future events that you've helped organize. And for all the listeners out there, uh, what I'm not a, a podcast host. I'm a mid-market investment banker focused on mergers, acquisition, helping to raise growth capital, and a little bit secondary. So if you are a founder out there or an owner of a company looking to exit, looking to raise growth capital, please contact me through, well, either my LinkedIn, Sean Flynn, investment banker, or you can connect with me on this, the website for the podcast, the SiliconValleyPodcast.com. And with that, you know, George, just I want to say again, thank you for your time this week on the Silicon Valley Podcast. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. 